So, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I want to first give special thanks to Dr. Calabresi for inviting me to come to uh, Amherst. Uh, it's the first time. Uh, I know he's been trying for a few years, so finally he got me. <laughs> These schedules were really bad all the time. So, um, so yeah, I, I'm going to be talking about uh, ischemic preconditioning now in the brain as it relates to stroke and actually cardiac arrest. So there is a little, little bit of heart here. Um, so since this is the first talk on stroke, uh, the, also the incidence of stroke is really large, even though it has dropped to the fourth uh, uh, number of, of uh, causes of death in the country, is still uh, a large component of uh, pathology in the U.S. Um, what, what's more important is that the disability that occurs following stroke is dramatic. Uh, we have a number of things that uh, no, there are not only motor uh, disabilities but also cognitive disabilities. Um, the other, of course, the numbers, you've seen it uh, during the morning session, uh, cardiac arrest. Uh, the numbers are staggering, uh, and if you add that to the stroke numbers, it's very large. Uh, but what I, I bring to your attention today is that, uh, in fact, the brain is one of the uh, uh, main organs affected by the lack of uh, blood uh, because of cardiac arrest. So, uh, in particular, um, we know that uh, the hippocampus uh, is highly susceptible uh, to cerebral ischemia. Now, the hippocampus in the brain is like the main area uh, involved in uh, learning and memory. Uh, it's, it's kind of where encoding and retrieval occurs, and when that area is damaged, then that's where you have all these cognitive deficits that happen um, in relation to other areas of the brain. So uh, this is the hippocampus in, in a rat, and uh, this is what happens uh, after just 10 minutes of uh, cardiac arrest. You have significant pathology in the uh, specific area of the hippocampus called the CA1 region of the hippocampus, uh, and as depicted here. So um, this area is basically a, an area that we want to salvage after cardiac arrest. Um, and in stroke, in fact, uh, now we know that the hippocampus is also affected in addition to many other areas of the, uh, the brain, the cortex, striatum, and so on and so forth. So the main goal in the field is really to uh, determine what are the pathophysiological mechanisms that uh, ensue following the ischemic events and, and trying to find potential therapies. Um, so, of course, this has been a, a major um, uh, endeavor. It's been extremely hard to find uh, good therapies, even though we have found what are the basic mechanisms. I like this uh, picture from uh, Uli Dernagel, uh, where he shows the, basically the time course of the pathology. Uh, and even though the, it was published in 2003, we know that this still prevails. Uh, you basically have uh, excitotoxicity, which occurs when you have excessive glutamate release because of the lack of ATP, uh, followed then by mitochondrial dysfunction, oxy oxidative damage, and uh, all of that then uh, promotes a number of things that occur over days, weeks, uh, and months. Uh, following the ischemic insult. So in fact, we know that we cannot look at cell death uh, just 24, three days later. We have to look at cell death uh, a week, a month, and months later. And you'll see that the pathology continue to, to grow. So, um, so the a challenge has been to look at all these potential uh, pharmacological agents that block some of these pathways and a number of clinical trials have been used, and uh, most of the clinical trials have failed. Most, not all, have failed, basically. Um, and why were they failing in animals? We really know how to cure stroke, uh, but uh, we don't know how to cure uh, stroke in patients or uh, the effects of cardiac arrest. 
So uh, have been many workshops and a number of scientists that got together and basically said, well, maybe we should come up with a cocktail of drugs, uh, initiate some clinical trials where we target excitotoxicity, oxidative damage, inflammation, and so on and so forth. Well, you know that that would be an incredible clinical trial. So it would be extremely hard. So another approach that has been proposed is the use of a drug that would have pleiotropic properties that would target many of these pathways at once. And that's where I think preconditioning has uh, benefits. Uh, ischemic preconditioning, I'm not gonna introduce it. You've heard this uh, all over today. Uh, but I have a different uh, saying from Nietzsche, and I think you've seen this, that which does not kill us makes us stronger. Uh, is a little bit older than Paracelsus, but uh, it still is the same concept. So again, this is uh, preconditioning our hands. Um, this is a basic model, which you, ha you have seen already in the heart. Uh, the sublethal ischemic insult followed by a period of recovery. Then the lethal ischemic insult uh, uh, that follows could be one hour, could be two days or three days. Uh, we actually have uh, determined uh, that, in fact, the second window, uh, which is the two to three days, is more robust than the early window. So, um, and here I'm adding a pharmacological agent that I'm going to be mentioning over and over in this talk. It's a peptide that promotes the activation of a PKC isozyme uh, that I will describe, describe later. But this peptide, basically, what we have done in my lab is to use these peptides to uh, simulate ischemic preconditioning. Because in fact, uh, we know that we're not gonna induce uh, brain ischemia, so even if it's sublethal. We really need to find a way to induce the same response by using a pharmacological agent or remote preconditioning as has been uh, described today. So again, uh, this is the basic uh, results that we have obtained over and over and over, uh, where you have um, the ischemic insult. So, uh, well, I can't find it, I'll use the mouse. Uh, so basically you have your ischemic insult. This is a C1 region of the hippocampus, which is wiped out with just 10 minutes of cerebral ischemia. If you induce two minutes of global ischemia two days prior, then you have a significant protection of this population of cells. So um, over more than 20 years of research, uh, we have uncovered a number of pathways uh, remarkably uh, the pathways are very similar to the heart, some of them at least. Uh, you have, for example, you have the, uh, what we call the presynaptic, the uh, release of the adenosine, uh, adenosine uh, during the sublethal ischemic insult. This is a triggering phase and uh, the activation of the adenosine A1 receptor. And that leads to uh, several steps, the promotion or the translocation of a PKC isozyme. We have a postsynaptic event. This is uh, paradoxically what causes cell death, the release of glutamate and the activation of the NMD receptor, which is a culprit in cell death, is in fact uh, an inductor of ischemic preconditioning or ischemic tolerance. So by mildly activating this receptor, you can uh, induce a, in, an increase in cytosolic calcium that initiates the signaling cascade that will promote ischemic tolerance. All these pathways tend to uh, end up in the activation of a PKC isozyme, uh, namely a protein kinase C epsilon. It happens in the heart as well, uh, but it plays a significant role in the activation uh, of the response, the ischemic tolerance response. So um, two, um, there is a lot of work that we have done on this, and I cannot summarize this in 15 minutes. Uh, so I'm going to give you a brief overview of two targets where we have observed uh, protection occurs. One is at the uh, synaptic terminal and the other one is on mitochondria. So um, 
initially we observed that if you implant a microdialysis probe in the brain uh, after you have preconditioned an animal, uh, you basically, in a normal animal, without preconditioning, you have this massive release of glutamate, which is uh, sorry, is shown here, uh, and that um, if you precondition, in fact, instead of increasing uh, massive concentrations of glutamate into the extracellular space, you actually release more GABA, and GABA is the main inhibitory neurotransmitter in the brain. So that was a very interesting finding. So it's a basically a shift in the response of the brain when you induce preconditioning. So something we wanted to test is, well, okay, so if this is happening, what is the electrophysiological response? And this is a cartoon of the hippocampus. We are doing whole cell recording, just looking at what's going on in the CE1 region of the uh, hippocampus. Uh, and the first study uh, actually revealed that in fact, there is a significant increase in the GABAergic responses, in the inhibitory responses. And that actually uh, was determined when we inhibit excitatory ex neurotransmitters, uh, block the receptors, NMDA and AMPA, use TTX, and determine the spontaneous miniature postsynaptic GABA responses. And what we observed is that in fact, with preconditioning or by adding a peptide that promotes the translocation of PKC epsilon, you actually enhance the GABAergic activity. And that's observed both in uh, the frequency of these responses, indicating that there is increased GABA release, or in the postsynaptic response, as in this case, uh, where you actually have uh, an increase in the amplitude of the GABA response. So that's already suggesting that the brain is shifting after preconditioning into an inhibitory state. So uh, another indication that this is happening is now looking at the intrinsic properties of action potentials. Uh, in this case, we're looking at uh, action potential frequency, thresholds, and amplitudes. And in all three cases, we observe that both uh, preconditioning or uh, this activation of PKC epsilon uh, decrease uh, the action potential amplitude, uh, affect the threshold, and increases the hyper, hyper, hyperpolarization that occurs following the action potentials. All of these will promote an, in, uh, an inhibitory uh, state in, in the brain. So, um, so how all of this is happening. We looked at one candidate, BDNF, uh, the brain-derived neurotrophic factor. This is uh, a master regulator of synaptic uh, function. Um, this, of course, acts on postsynaptic receptors. The track B receptor is the high affinity BDNF receptor. Uh, so in a number of studies, we looked at uh, different ways in which uh, we see the effect of BDNF. The first one was looking at mRNA levels by in situ hybridization. We look at BDNF levels are indeed increased in the hippocampus. Um, and uh, Western blots also indicated that both IPC and uh, uh, PKC epsilon uh, both increase the uh, levels of BDNF, the BDNF protein. Uh, and we determined by immunohistochemistry that the protein levels are in fact in these C1 pyramidal cells. So next, what we wanted to do was then to inhibit uh, the binding of BDNF to this track B receptor. And we did that by using uh, this inhibitor, uh, K2542A, uh, 52A. Uh, in the case of both ischemic preconditioning or by adding the peptide. And in both cases, as you can see, uh, the electrophysiological properties were inhibited. Everything that we saw uh, happen uh, with uh, PKC epsilon activation or IPC uh, was inhibited with this inhibitor, suggesting that BDNF via the uh, uh, track B receptor is orchestrating this response. So overall, we just want to see if then uh, this uh, tendency to increase inhibitory uh, pathways in the brain actually will delay uh, the uh, depolarization that happens 
once you induce the ischemic insult. So this is a classical example of the membrane potential inducing in vitro uh, oxygen glucose deprivation. Uh, and once you do that, you have the more or less six, uh, four to six minutes when the neurons start depolarizing. But if you precondition with this peptide, you significantly delay the time to depolarization. And uh, this translates when you look now at cell death, and these are in vitro studies, uh, that if you add, again, the inhibitor of the track B receptor, uh, you actually increase cell death and block the uh, neuroprotection afforded by IPC or PKC epsilon. So the conclusion of these initial uh, studies, and we have followed this further, um, is that BDNF plays a significant role in the preconditioning pathway in the brain, and this is a little bit different than what you would see in the heart. So the next target is uh, mitochondria, and you heard a, a recent talk on mitochondria uh, in the heart. Uh, again, very similar pathways involved here. Uh, of course, most of the pathology with mitochondria occurs during reperfusion. That's when you have these increased, uh, uh, what's what we call hyperemia, increased blood flow, a lot of oxygen going into the tissue that was ischemic, and that's when you start producing all these rusts. Uh, in, and that initiates the oxidative damage pathway. So uh, all these pathways, I'm not going to get in detail, uh, but uh, we have been investigating what is preconditioning doing with mitochondria. And early on, we found that, in fact, if you're looking at just respiration, if you induce uh, ischemia and harvest mitochondria 24, hour later, 24 hour, hour, hours, hours later, and then look at respiration of mitochondria, you'll see the significant deficits that happen uh, following uh, the ischemic insult, as depicted here, when you have pyrimylate, which would be for complex one respiration, or succinate glycerol 3-phosphate-4, uh, complex two, or ascorbate TMPV, which would target complex four of mitochondria respiration. But if you, if you precondition um, if you precondition, then you uh, block all these deficits, as you can see here in green. So we have followed this up by looking at uh, what is PKC epsilon doing uh, to mitochondria. And one of the first things we did is that we observed that PKC epsilon actually tends to translocate towards synaptic terminals. Uh, the levels of PKC epsilon over time, as you can see here, significantly increase after the preconditioning insult in synaptic terminals, specifically. So uh, we used uh, the synaptosomal preparation to investigate what is PKC epsilon doing to mitochondria. Uh, basically, the model we used is uh, mitochondria is into this uh, synaptosomal preparation. We add the detonin to uh, 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 add all these uh, different uh, substrates for mitochondria and uh, add the PKC epsilon agonist to look at respiration. And what we observed is that, in fact, PKC epsilon is primed to then increase respiration of mitochondria. Uh, this would be a simulation of what happens during uh, actually ischemia because you have increased levels of PKC epsilon in the synaptosomal preparation. And once you have this gimmick insult, then PKC epsilon is primed to translocate very quickly to mitochondria and increase significantly respiration. So now you have two components. You are inhibiting electrical activity, so decreasing the need for a lot of energy, right? And on top of that, you are now increasing the capacity of mitochondria to produce ATP. So it's, it's a, a, a very nice balance to have. So um, the other component we've been looking at is NAD levels. Uh, NAD has become extremely important uh, again. Uh, early on, we have observed that preconditioning, in fact, had, was increasing NADH levels. This was uh, detected by uh, fluorescence. Um, and we observed now that PKC epsilon was, in fact, increasing NADH levels. Now, what's the importance of uh, NAD, well, um, 
there are a number of key enzymes, it's not just bioenergetics, but a number of key enzymes uh, are, uh, are utilize NAD as a cofactor, PARPs, for example, and sirtuins are other uh, type of enzymes that require NAD. Uh, so study what is preconditioning or PKC epsilon doing uh, to the NAD uh, uh, salvage pathway. Uh, we looked at uh, the different en key enzymes. In, the, in this particular case, we were looking at NAMT, uh, which is the rate limiting uh, key step in the production of NAD. And we actually observed that if you inject the peptide two days prior, the levels of NAMT are significantly increased. This is uh, by looking at uh, immunofluorescence uh, of NAMT. Uh, in both in it. This is in vitro and this is uh, the next one is in vitro. In vitro both uh, you see a significant increase of this ray limiting enzyme uh, NAMT. Uh, we have this, this uh, a more comprehensive study. We have looked at also MNAT which is the next enzyme and we have evidence that MNAT is also uh, increased. It's, it's different isozymes of MNAT. So as I said, uh, key enzymes require uh, NAD as a cofactor. Uh, PARP is believed to play a significant role in the pathology of ischemia because it's a DNA repair enzyme and because it's utilizing a lot of uh, NAD, they, it's believed that it depletes NAD levels and therefore uh, uh, affects the bioenergetics of neurons. So sirtuins are the other enzymes. Uh, they gained prominence in the early 2000s uh, when they were linked to lifespan. Uh, uh, there was this uh, editorial in Nature where they were talking about, well, we finally found the uh, fountain of youth. It happens to be them in Florida, so, but it has nothing to do. It was discovered in a different lab. So uh, anyways, uh, Yes, SIR1 became very popular, uh, not just SIR1, now we know that other SIR twins are playing a significant role too. But SIR1 was popular and uh, there was the uh, polyphenol resveratrol, which uh, we knew that uh, activated SIR1. Uh, now we think that it's more indirect, the activation of SIR1 is not a direct activation. But nevertheless, we know that the activity of SIR1 increases. So we have, in a number of studies, looked at the activity of SIR1, and in fact, it's increased both uh, after preconditioning and resveratrol. And in a number of studies, we have looked at, in fact, uh, if you now, instead of the PKC epsilon, we are emulating preconditioning by adding resveratrol. Uh, resveratrol actually mimics perfectly well uh, the preconditioning response. Uh, in this case, uh, as you can see here, uh, this IPC is the normal the number of normal neurons uh, after in the hippocampus, and uh, at 10 milligrams per kilogram at two days prior, you get a significant protection. Uh, if you add the inhibitor of uh, SIR1, then you block that protection, and all of a sudden the brain becomes like a normal sham experiment. Uh, interestingly, at higher concentrations, uh, resveratrol didn't work, and that's why this fits this meeting. Uh, resver resveratrol is acting like a hormetic uh, compound. So, uh, before everybody jumps and starts over drinking uh, red wine to get your sirtuins activated, uh, just remember that you will need a lot of wine to get enough resveratrol. Just a Pinot Noir, which is the one that has the highest concentration, is 5 milligrams. So if it's 10 milligrams per kilogram that gives you protection, just do the math and you'll need a lot of... So I think the ethanol story works better. <laughs> so um, I'm just going to briefly touch on one last story, which is um, that recently we discovered that in fact a single dose of resveratrol promotes protection for a much longer window. This window was 14 days. And we actually uh, injected resveratrol IP, waited two weeks and uh, induced the ischemic insult and we got protection. Now, it's not that we decided to look at two weeks. We actually were looking at uh, to see if uh, resveratrol 
the effect on sirtuins was will desensitize if tachyphylaxis would occur. And we did a number of studies where we did every day injection, every other day, and so on and so forth. And at some point, we had a control that was 14 days. In really surprised, found that at two weeks, resveratrol was providing protection. And we are now investigating heavily what are the things that are happening, epigenetic changes that are occurring at two weeks after a single injection of resveratrol. It's, it's really an amazing story. So I, I will finish just by, since we've heard a lot of the heart, and uh, just giving you the clinical scenarios more for the brain. Uh, patients that, on, that undergo cabbage have a high incidence of stroke. So those would be perfect candidates for um, using any pharmacological agent or any type of preconditioning to induce protection. Patients that have had transient ischemic attacks, they have about 10% uh, incidence of a subsequent stroke. Uh, patients that have subarachnoid hemorrhage, uh, they undergo about 20, 30% of the patients undergo what we call the uh, vasospasms or delayed ischemic uh, cerebral ischemia. Um, and they actually die from that. So it's, it would be a good group of uh, patients uh, to target for preconditioning. Neurological procedures and all stroke patients have a high incidence of having uh, a subsequent stroke. So it pre the preconditionable population is really large. Uh, we have just, you know, going over the numbers and uh, having added, you know, uh, others. So I, I think uh, the translational value of preconditioning is very high. So in conclusions, just uh, briefly, signaling pathways activated by ischemic preconditioning have pleiotropic properties that can be used for therapies in a stroke or cardiac arrest. Um, PKC epsilon and resveratrol are two of these chemicals that we think are powerful uh, mimetics of ischemic preconditioning. Uh, and these pharmacological agents could be used to emulate IPC in, in a prophylactic manner uh, in all these patients that uh, could have a subsequent stroke. So um, this is a group of a large number of people that have uh, worked on this. Uh, this is my group. Um, and uh, also, of course, NIH and the American Heart Association has funded this uh, research. Thank you. Well, I, I don't see why not. I think, you know, uh, there is a lot of evidence uh, from your studies, the things that you have shown here, that uh, it's, it's possible. Uh, but you have to convince study section, which is not easy. I, I, the only the only minor caveat here would be adherence, right? Having patience to come if you're gonna do it every other day or something like that. Okay. 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 Yeah. The thing is that this population is we don't know when they're gonna have a stroke. We just know that they're gonna have they are prone to have stroke because they have a high incidence. So it would be hard to, to tell, but. And the, the people that actually practice, they right. have a lot of stroke. Yes. Stroke also 
Yes, absolutely. So that's the question. Uh, yeah. It's a flight that takes me to Africa and Afghanistan. Right. My friends are in Kentucky. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, there are a couple of TBI people here that probably will give you a better answer uh, on that. Uh, we only have one study on preconditioning and TBI. I did it with Dalton Dietrich a long time ago, and we got protection. But we haven't really followed that up. Uh, so I, I don't know if it would work in concussions. Uh, yes, uh, it does. We have measured the activity of uh, CER1, and we actually have, uh, by microdialysis, we detected it. It's very low dose. Uh, it does uh, change uh, a structure, but some of the resveratrol actually gets to the brain. How do you like the dose question? Yeah. Well, we haven't really looked at the actual concentration, final concentration. We had just detected resveratrol in the brain after a single administration. What we have looked is at the activity of CER1, and we have seen the activity go, go up. So uh, again, it may not be a direct effect. It might be in the signaling pathway, but uh, we have seen that it increased the activity. Yeah. Unfortunately, both 